It seems like this episode was all about being free from secrets, but now that they are all out, it seems like more chaos is on the rise. Lord Jesus, I can't take it. But let's talk about it. So I usually break the episodes down based on the storylines of the characters, but this recap, I am going to thoroughly give my thoughts on what happened throughout the show. So with that being said, I want to say that I am happy seeing Keisha and Cam back on my screen. It seems like only Nate will be missing this episode, but Keisha said that she was at a pre-law conference and I didn't even know Nate was pre-law, maybe because it isn't that relevant, but you know what? That's so fitting for her. <laughs> but I think it's pretty sucky that, you know, she's gonna be missing Princeton Homecoming, which is what this episode is all about. Speaking of, I love that they opened up with the Battle of the Bands type of scene while everyone is watching. Because if you know anything about HBCUs, the band is damn near the most important feature of the school. And that's just point blank, period. Academics, status, and sports, cute and all, but what that band look like, okay? <laughs> and more importantly, I am happy that we are seeing an actual homecoming vibe from the show because I was starting to get worried being that things were winding down. I mean, hey, this is all American homecoming. So I feel like we should be getting a homecoming episode each season or something similar to it. Like at my alma mater, the illustrious Florida A&M University, we have the football focused homecoming that is the most important week, of course. But then we also have homecoming for basketball and other alum slash present student events that is somewhat similar, but smaller to the original homecoming. We also have like two or three classic games where we play rivalry schools and those games are so huge that it feels like homecoming on repeat. So maybe that is something they can incorporate in a show to give it, you know, that extra HBCU feel and comparison. But moving on from all of that, we get into a scene with Damon and Thea. And my girl is just happy-go-lucky, bragging about some of the things Damon has been doing for her lately. And when I say she is floating on the clouds, I am not exaggerating. But I love that for her. Yet yeah, something in me feels like that means Damon's about to trip out or something. Like he about to mess up in some way because there is no way this show is going to let things be so good between the two of them. Even though it should be, hell, we don't need all the relationships to be in shambles like Jordan and Simone or Kim and Keisha, but I digress. So in the midst of Thea being on clouds with Damon, his mom pops up and he introduces Thea to her as his girlfriend. And child, he about choked on the hairball trying to get that out. But see, that's what I don't like because if you're really feeling someone, it shouldn't be no second guessing feelings about announcing who she is to you. But then again, Damien mom isn't to be played with, so maybe he didn't want her acting, you know, any type of way or saying something crazy, which she did anyways. <laughs> so after the introduction, Thea was like, oh, you know, I heard so much about you. And of course his mom hit her with the hook. I wish I could say the same about you. And then she started getting shady and downplaying the fact that Damon just called Thea his girlfriend and, and called Thea his little friend, not taking them seriously at all. Like, okay, Mama Sims, not too much on Thea now, especially when you got your own relationship problems to deal with that you don't even know about yet. But, she was in for a rude awakening when Damon did tell her, but you know, moving on in the show. Amari gets face to face with Zeke and clearly he's been dodging her, talking about, oh, he has work to do so he can't talk to her. But he was just outside watching the bands play against each other. <sighs> I cannot stand him, okay? He's so full of S-H-I-T. But one thing about Amara, baby, she isn't going to waste any time and called him out on the merger of Brixton and the PWI school cause. He's been prepping with, um, prepping for with Veronica and the board of trustees. Now, to be honest, I tried to give him the benefit of the doubt with not knowing, and it was happening under his nose. But I had to be honest with myself and knew he was probably spearheading this whole thing, which he was. I mean, he is the president, so. 
So in one of these scenes, Veronica and Zeke was walking around the halls at Ringston in an area where a lot of predominantly black important figures and influencers were on the wall. And Veronica was talking about adding white app developers to the hall. And Amara heard what she was pitching and she was not here for the BS at all. Baby, listen. Amara is on Veronica behind about everything when it comes to Princeton and the changes that may happen when or if they merge with the white school. And in this situation with the hall or the wall, hall, wall, same thing. Amara was able to say something that Zeke agreed on and he put his foot down about not letting, you know, the change happen with adding the white folks at this sacred place at Princeton. But that was minuscule compared to the real challenge ahead, which was making sure the damn merger doesn't happen at all. But it was already in effect. But that didn't stop Amara from putting in full effort to stop it. And with it being homecoming, she gathered some of the alum and told them what was happening and they need to come up with a plan to stop it. And they raised $4 million. But it wasn't enough and it was too late because once the white school found out that a story was about to break about the merger, they backed out of the deal. Hmm, hmm, it says a lot. So the board of trustees at Ringston voted to have the school sold unless enough money was raised by the end of homecoming, which is freaking crazy. Like, be for real. Now, what accepts me is that Amara was able to raise $4 million in a day to help the school, which means the alumni is willing to help if they know the school is in a bind. But the BOT and Zeke was willing to hide the fact that the school was in a bad spot. When maybe if they was more transparent with the alumni, they would have came forward to help and give more money. That's crazy. Granted, I also get it from a business standpoint that opening up the school business like that, especially after the cheating scandal, would have been a bad play. But still, the situation is only getting worse to take control of anyways. But moving along in the show, Simone, Thea, and the other tennis girls are getting ready for their tennis tor tournament and some white girl walks up to Thea talking smack. Like, girl, back the hell up. But come to find out, this is a girl that always have pressure with Thea because she feel like Thea isn't as good as her because she always beat Thea in their matches. But the girl uses a tactic that messes with Thea's mind and gets her out of her zone. Anywho, Damon and JR is at the tennis tournament supporting Thea and Simone, and child Simone is jealous of Damon and Thea. Boy, she can't even hide it in her face. But JR already know the vibes and called her out on it, asking, you know, if it's awkward for her. And she said she's happy for them. Yeah, I bet you are, Simone Hicks. But we couldn't even get into the juicy details about that because one of Simone's teammates told her that she had to play Simone in the tournament, which is crazy because it's a lose-lose situation for the both of them. But it is what it is. So when it was time, the two of them competed and Simone won, of course, because she's really that girl. But she really ended up losing to us the end of all of it because she didn't make a spot on the top six of the team and she was basically done playing on the team for the rest of the season. While homegirl, she beat, you know, kept her scholarship and stayed on the team and all this other stuff. Now that was crazy and unexpected, to be honest. I mean, Simone is always down bad when it comes to tennis. I just hope next season, because you know, they did get renewed for season two. Shout out to them. But I hope next season she is on the up and up because she be getting tried like she's not that girl when she is when it comes to tennis. Now, speaking of being that girl, I had to jump back into Thea because like I said earlier, she had to deal with the white girl, you know, the white mean girl throwing her off her game. But not only that, the girl was destroying her tennis record. See, now, that's why I draw the line. Don't touch my stuff. But Thea couldn't do anything about it because it was almost time for her game. So of course, Simone was there to calm her down and let her use her racket. But all of that isn't important. What it is though, was Simone called Damon to come and support Thea at the game, even though she was sick about it. So when Damon came, him and Simone had their little heart to heart they've been waiting to have for so long, child. And sadly, it was on the account of Thea because while Damon and Simone was talking, Thea heard everything and was distraught hearing that they had feelings for each other, they didn't act on. But it was the fact that it was brought up by Damon for me, like, sir, 
why is that a conversation at your girl's tennis match? More importantly, why is that a conversation at all? Like, ugh. So by Thea hearing that and then seeing them interact, she couldn't focus um, on the first half of the game, but eventually she tightened up and she beat the little white girl, as she should, and left immediate, immediately after the game. So she didn't speak to Simone or Damon. So later on that night, Damon wanted to see what was up with her. She told him like, you know, I heard y'all conversation. And he told her about him and Simone feelings towards each other. And it's just crazy that Thea was like the only one who didn't know that Damon and Simone had a little, you know, love connection. Granted, she isn't a part of that core group, but still, girl, open your eyes. I love that Thea called him out on not being open with her about things that is happening with him. Um, and she had every right to feel some way because like she said, if they are going to be in a real relationship, he has to let her in on everything. And I agree, especially when, you know, she's so open with him. Now, they tried to throw in how Thea knew Simone and Drew and wasn't together anymore and she didn't tell Damien because he believes they still are. But oh well, that's not their place. And it better not be something Damien gets mad at her about knowing and not telling him about. But if it was me, I would have told him just to see his real reaction and how he would be moving when it comes to Simone. That way, I know the real and, you know, dump him. But that's just me. And Thea has hope for them together, so we shall see how things play out. I also find it funny that Damon called Thea his bright light, and those were the same exact words his mom used on him. Like, dang, you couldn't even give that girl her own little special boss? Dang. So moving on from that, there was a scene where Damon and JR was speaking about Coach Marcus in a way he has been bugging out lately. But in this episode, Coach started, you know, off cool. Like, he was good. Like, in a more uppity zone than he was last episode. But it didn't last too long. And I'll get into that, you know, a little in a minute. But the conversation between JR and Damon flipped into Damon talking about how he has to tell his mom a secret about his birth parents and how his dad has been lying to her damn near their entire marriage. That's gonna be a big ass bomb drop, okay? Even worse, it's the fact that it's coming from her son. This is just a, a, a mess. This whole situation is a mess. But eventually he tells her about him finding out about his birth mom and his dad her husband being his birth father. And I felt so bad for her because she was in heavy denial and was ready to snap on Celine about telling Damon such an outrageous lie. But Damon had to put it into perspective for her, like, mom, think about it. You never seen any paperwork on me. There isn't a foul of it in the adoption system. And it's all because dad is my real dad. So he didn't need any paperwork on me. Kena about fell out and lashed out as she should have. Even though at first she was in denial saying that, oh, Xavier would never be unfaithful to her. Yet, yeah, he was. And that just goes to show you, ladies, don't be dumb in love. Watch, check, in, secure everything. Sometimes when you are on top of the world with the man of your dreams, he's in the slums doing you dirty, which is sad. But men gonna do what men do. You just have to do what you have to do for you. It's just sad that neither her or Damon can confront Xavier because, you know, his Alzheimer's disease. But the information is out and they can move forward accordingly. I just know, at least I hope, you know, Celine and Kina, you know, meet up face to face one day and you know, that little showdown happen, okay? Now going back to the whole Coach Marcus situation because he's the one that's been giving a real showdown, okay? So when the baseball team was having, you know, that barbecue event, Damon went to, you know, talk to Coach Marcus about the cheating scandal and asking if, you know, he's good or whatnot. Being that this episode was the anniversary of when everything popped off. And with Marcus being on such a good vibe at the moment, he was acting like everything was cool and plus the team was doing well. So he was on a high cruise control. Then he started telling Damon about how he needs to, you know, bring the media around to cover what he's doing at the barbecue because it would be a good look for him and the baseball teams and, and he gonna be, you know, the talk of the town as a coach and all this stuff. Which I think is so crazy because being in the media was what he was cursing JR about last episode. But I get it. He's not himself and his moves are continuously changing up and down. But golly, coach, go get some help, please. But baby, his mood quickly went from high 
to horror when he chose violence against his coaching staff. I mean to laugh, y'all. But he really chose violence. Like, he did not play with them. He chose violence against his coaching staff when he seen them talking to, you know, the reporter guy, Ralph, about how good the team has been doing since the cheating scandal. And coach didn't like that one bit. It felt like they were discussing him, so he went off, told Ralph to get out and fight his staff, while also telling them to apologize to him. He went off, off, okay? But that was the tip of the iceberg because things got worse when Ralph and Coach ran into each other again and Ralph called Marcus out for being, you know, the whistleblower that helped Amara expose Coach Shaw and the cheating scandal. And that moment took him over the edge and he decided to be free and let all his secrets out about him being, you know, the anonymous source and just breaking down completely. It was a very sad scene, to be honest. And I have to say that Corey, the guy playing Marcus, was, I mean, has been acting his ass off in this series, especially these past three episodes. But anyways, after his outburst, he ran off somewhere no one can find him because he left a message to Amara basically stating he will miss her and not to find him so he can, you know, find peace as if it was some sort of suicidal message. At least that's what I got from it. And so did Amara because she told Damon and JR they need to find him immediately. And I think it's safe to say we may not see him in the, you know, season finale, but you know, I hope he don't hurt himself. Um, and he's just, you know, going to find help or something. Now, moving on from Marcus, I want to get into Kim and Keisha because their entire situation low-key brought some joy to this episode unexpectedly because, whew, Lord knows I didn't see it going that way. So with that being said, Keisha was trying to have a conversation with Kim because clearly therapy has been good to her and she is ready to express her true feelings to him. But baby, she may be a tad bit late because the singing girl, Gabrielle, has all of Kim's attention. And even though seeing Kim and the girl connects, so well bothered Keisha, it didn't stop her from expressing her feelings to him and letting him know like, you know, she's been working on herself and she's ready to give, you know, them a true chance. But of course he folded and said, you know, that they are dope as friends. Just being silly as hell. Like, boy, please. Y'all been stepped out of the friend phase when y'all was around at school having sex and you were out here catching feelings. But I mean, I guess it was a good way to let Keisha down. And she almost gave up and, you know, took what he said to heart. But then she gave it one more shot and hit him with a letter she wrote to herself about, you know, her growth. And of course he fell for it because why not? Keisha is a real ass B-I-T-C-H. And I can't wait to see the evolution of their relationship because neither one of them have a filter. So that's going to be a good watch. It really is. But that's all I have to say for my recap for this episode. I hope you all enjoyed it. And if you have thoughts, you already know what to do. Like this video and show your girl some love. Come in your thoughts and let's discuss what you thought of this episode and where you think things are heading. And last but certainly not least, subscribe and join the channel, baby. Bye.